Chapter Two, Part Two of the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter Two. Glasgow is in many respects similar to Edinburgh, possessing the same wines, the same tall houses. Of this city, the artisan observes. Quote, the working class forms here some seventy-eight per cent of the whole population, about three hundred thousand, and lives in parts of the city which exceed in wretchedness and squalor the lowest nooks of St. Giles and Whitechapel, the liberties of Dublin, the wines of Edinburgh. There are numbers of such localities in the heart of the city, south of the Trongate, westward from the Salt Market, in Colton and off the High Street, endless labyrinths of lanes or wines into which open at almost every step courts or blind alleys formed by ill-ventilated high-piled waterless and dilapidated houses these are literally swarming with inhabitants they contain three or four families upon each floor perhaps twenty persons in some cases each story is let out in sleeping places so that fifteen to twenty persons are packed one on top of the other i cannot say accommodated in a single room these districts shelter the poorest, most depraved, and worthless members of the community, and may be regarded as the sources of those frightful epidemics which, beginning here, spread desolation over Glasgow. End quote. Let us hear how J. C. Simmons, government commissioner for the investigation of the condition of the hand weavers, describes these portions of the city. Quote, I have seen wretchedness in some of its worst phases both here and upon the continent but until i visited the wines of glasgow i did not believe that so much crime misery and disease could exist in any civilized country in the lower lodging-houses ten twelve sometimes twenty persons of both sexes all ages and various degrees of nakedness sleep indiscriminately huddled together upon the floor these dwellings are usually so damp filthy and ruinous that no one could wish to keep his horse in one of them and in another place, quote, the wines of Glasgow contain a fluctuating population of fifteen to thirty thousand human beings. This quarter consists wholly of narrow alleys and square courts, in the middle of every one of which there lies a dung-heap. Revolting as was the outward appearance of these courts, I was yet not prepared for the filth and wretchedness within. In some of the sleeping-places which we visited at night, the superintendent of police, Captain Miller and Simmons, we found a complete layer of human beings stretched upon the floor, often fifteen to twenty, some clad, others naked, men and women indiscriminately. Their bed was a litter of mouldy straw, mixed with rags. There was little or no furniture, and the only thing which gave these dens any shimmer of habitableness was a fire upon the hearth. Theft and prostitution form the chief means of subsistence of this population. No one seemed to take the trouble to cleanse this Augean stable, this pandemonium, this tangle of crime, filth, and pestilence, in the centre of the second city of the kingdom. An extended examination of the lowest districts of other cities never revealed anything half so bad, either in intensity of moral and physical infection, nor in comparative density of population. In this quarter most of the houses have been declared by the court of guild ruinous and unfit for habitation, but precisely these are the most densely populated, because according to the law no rent can be demanded for them." The great manufacturing district in the centre of the British islands, the thickly peopled stretch of West Yorkshire and South Lancashire, with its numerous factory towns, yields nothing to the other great manufacturing centres. The woollen district of the west riding of Yorkshire is a charming region, a beautiful green hill country, whose elevations grow more rugged towards the west until they reach their highest point in the bold ridge of Blackstone Edge, the watershed between the Irish Sea and the German Ocean. The valleys of the Aire, along which stretches Leeds, and of the Calder, through which the Manchester Leeds Railway runs, are among the most attractive in England, and are strewn in all directions with the factories, villages, and towns. The houses of rough grey stone look so neat and clean in comparison with the black and brick buildings of Lancashire that it is a pleasure to look at them. But on coming into the towns themselves, one finds little to rejoice over. Leeds lies, as the artisan describes it, and as I found confirmed upon examination, quote, 
on a gentle slope that descends into the valley of the air. This stream flows through the city for about a mile and a half, and is exposed to violent floods during thaws or heavy rain. The higher western portions of the city are clean for such a large town. But the low-lying districts along the river and its tributary becks are narrow, dirty, and enough in themselves to shorten the lives of the inhabitants, especially of little children. Added to this, the disgusting state of the working men's districts about Kirkgate, Marsh Lane, Cross Street, and Richmond Road, which is chiefly attributable to their unpaved, drainless streets, irregular architecture, numerous courts and alleys, and total lack of the most ordinary means of cleanliness, all this taken together is explanation enough of the excessive mortality in these unhappy abodes of filthy misery. In consequence of the overflows of the air, which it must be added like all other rivers in the service of manufacture, flows into the city at one end clear and transparent, and flows out at the other end thick, black, and foul, smelling of all possible refuse. Quote, the houses and cellars are often so full of water that they have to be pumped out and at such time the water rises, even where there are sewers, out of them into cellars, engenders miasmatic vapours strongly impregnated with sulphurated hydrogen, and leaves a disgusting residuum highly injurious to health. During the spring floods of 1839 the action of such a choking of the sewers was so injurious that, according to the report of the Registrar of Births and Deaths for this part of the town, there were three deaths to two births whereas in the same three months in every other part of the town there were three births to two deaths. Other thickly populated districts are without any sewers whatsoever, or so badly provided as to derive no benefit from them. In some rows of houses the cellars are seldom dry. In certain districts there are several streets covered with soft mud a foot deep. The inhabitants have made vain attempts from time to time to repair these streets with shovelfuls of cinders, but in spite of all such attempts, Dung heaps and pools of dirty water emptied from the houses fill all the holes until wind and sun dry them up. An ordinary cottage in Leeds occupies not more than five yards square of land, and usually consists of a cellar, a living room, and one sleeping room. These contracted dwellings, filled day and night with human beings, are another point dangerous alike to the morals and the health of the inhabitants." and how greatly these cottages are crowded, the report on the health of the working classes quoted above bears testimony, quote, In Leeds we found brothers and sisters, and lodgers of both sexes, sharing the parents' sleeping room, whence arise consequences at the contemplation of which human feeling shudders, end quote. So too Bradford, which, but seven miles from Leeds at the junction of several valleys, lies upon the banks of a small, coal-black, foul-smelling stream. On weekdays the town is enveloped in a grey cloud of coal smoke, but on a fine Sunday it offers a superb picture when viewed from the surrounding heights. Yet within reigns the same filth and discomfort as in Leeds. The older portions of the town are built upon steep hillsides, and are narrow and irregular. In the lanes, alleys, and courts lie filth and debris in heaps. The houses are ruinous, dirty, and miserable, and in the immediate vicinity of the river and the valley bottom I found many a one whose ground floor, half buried in the hillside, was totally abandoned. In general, the portions of the valley bottom in which working men's cottages have crowded between the tall factories are among the worst built and dirtiest districts of the whole town. In the newer portions of this, as of every other factory town, the cottages are more regular, being built in rows, but they share here too all the evils incident to the customary method of providing working men's dwellings evils of which we shall have occasions to speak more particularly in discussing Manchester. The same is true of the remaining towns of the West Riding, especially of Barnsley, Halifax, and Huddersfield. The last named, the handsomest by far of all the factory towns of Yorkshire and Lancashire, by reason of its charming situation and modern architecture, has yet its bad quarter. For a committee, appointed by a meeting of citizens to survey the town, reported August 5, 1844, quote, It is notorious that in Huddersfield whole streets and many lanes and courts are neither paved nor supplied with sewers nor other drains, that in them refuse, debris, and filth of every sort lies accumulating, festers and rots, and that nearly everywhere stagnant water accumulates in pools, in consequence of which the adjoining dwellings must inevitably be bad and filthy, 
so that in such places diseases arise and threaten the health of the whole town. End quote. If we cross Blackstone Edge or penetrate it with the railroad, we enter upon that classic soil on which English manufacture has achieved its masterwork, and from which all labour movements emanate, namely South Lancashire with its central city Manchester. Again we have beautiful hill country, sloping gently from the watershed westwards towards the Irish Sea, with the charming green valleys of the Ribble, the Irwell, the Mersey, and their tributaries, a country which, a hundred years ago chiefly swampland, thinly populated, is now sown with towns and villages, and is the most densely populated strip of country in England. In Lancashire, and especially in Manchester, English manufacture finds at once its starting point and its centre. The Manchester Exchange is the thermometer for all the fluctuations of trade. The modern art of manufacture has reached its perfection in Manchester. In the cotton industry of South Lancashire, the application of the forces of nature, the superseding of hand labour by machinery, especially by the power loom and the self-acting mule, and the division of labour are seen at the highest point. And if we recognise in these three elements that which is characteristic of modern manufacture, we must confess that the cotton industry has remained in advance of all other branches of industry from the beginning down to the present day. The effects of modern manufacture upon the working class must necessarily develop here most freely and perfectly, and the manufacturing proletariat present itself in its fullest classic perfection. The degradation to which the application of steam power, machinery, and the division of labor reduce the working man, and the attempts of the proletariat to rise above this abasement, must likewise be carried to the highest point and with the fullest consciousness. Hence, because Manchester is the classic type of a modern manufacturing town, and because I know it as intimately as my own native town, more intimately than most of its residents know it, we shall make a longer stay here. The towns surrounding Manchester vary little from the central city, so far as the working people's quarters are concerned, except that the working class forms, if possible, a larger proportion of their population. These towns are purely industrial and conduct all their business through Manchester, upon which they are in every respect dependent, whence they are inhabited only by working men and petty tradesmen while Manchester has a very considerable commercial population, especially of commission and quote-unquote respectable retail dealers. Hence Bolton, Preston, Wigan, Bury, Rockdale, Middleton, Haywood, Oldham, Ashton, Stowley Bridge, Stockport, etc., though nearly all towns of thirty, fifty, seventy to ninety thousand inhabitants, are almost wholly working people's districts, interspersed only with factories, a few thoroughfares lined with shops, and a few lanes along which the gardens and houses of the manufacturers are scattered like villas. The towns themselves are badly and irregularly built with foul courts, lanes and back alleys, reeking of coal smoke, and especially dingy from the originally bright red brick turned black with time, which is here the universal building material. Cellar dwellings are general here. Wherever it is in any way possible, these subterranean dens are constructed and a very considerable portion of the population dwells in them. Among the worst of these towns after Preston and Oldham is Bolton, eleven miles northwest of Manchester. It has, so far as I have been able to observe in my repeated visits, but one main street, a very dirty one, Deansgate, which serves as a market, and is even in the finest weather a dark, unattractive hole, in spite of the fact that, except for the factories, its sides are formed by low one- and two-storied houses. Here, as everywhere, the older part of the town is especially ruinous and miserable. The dark-coloured body of water, which leaves the beholder in doubt whether it is a brook or a long string of stagnant puddles, flows through the town and contributes its share to the total pollution of the air, by no means pure without it. There is Stockport, too, which lies on the Cheshire side of the Mersey, but belongs nevertheless to the manufacturing district of Manchester. It lies in a narrow valley along the Mersey, so that the streets slope down a steep hill on one side and up an equally steep one on the other, while the railway from Manchester to Birmingham passes over a high viaduct above the city and the whole valley. Stockport is renowned throughout the entire district as one of the duskiest, smokiest holes, and looks, indeed, especially when viewed from the viaduct, excessively repellent. But far more repulsive are the cottages and cellar dwellings of the working class, 
which stretch in long rows through all parts of the town from the valley bottom to the crest of the hill i do not remember to have seen so many cellars used as dwellings in any other town of this district a few miles northeast of stockport is ashton under lyne one of the newest factory towns of this region it stands on the slope of a hill at the foot of which are the canal and the river tame and is in general built on the newer more regular plan five or six parallel streets stretch along the hill intersected at right angles by others leading down into the valley by this method the factories would be excluded from the town proper even if the proximity of the river and the canalway did not draw them all into the valley where they stand thickly crowded belching forth black smoke from their chimneys to this arrangement ashton owes a much more attractive appearance than that of most factory towns the streets are broad and cleaner the cottages look new bright red and comfortable but the modern system of building cottages for working men has its own disadvantages every street has its concealed back lane to which a narrow paved path leads and which is all the dirtier and although i saw no buildings except a few on entering which could have been more than fifty years old there are even in ashton streets in which cottages are getting bad where the bricks and the house corners are no longer firm but shift about in which the walls have cracks and will not hold the chalk whitewash inside streets whose dirty smoke begrimed aspect is nowise different from that of the other towns of the district except that in ashton this is the exception not the rule a mile eastward lies stalybridge also on the tame in coming over the hill from ashton the traveller has at the top both right and left fine large gardens with superb villa-like houses in their midst built usually in the elizabethan style which is to the gothic precisely what the anglican church is to the apostolic roman catholic a hundred paces farther and stalybridge shows itself in the valley in sharp contrast with the beautiful country seats in sharp contrast even with the modest cottages of ashton stalybridge lies in a narrow crooked ravine much narrower even than the valley at stockport and both sides of this ravine are occupied by an irregular group of cottages houses and mills on entering the very first cottages are narrow smoke begrimed old and ruinous and as the first houses so the whole town a few streets lie in the narrow valley bottom most of them run criss-cross pell-mell up hill and down and in nearly all the houses by reason of this sloping situation the ground floor is half buried in the earth and what multitudes of courts back lanes and remote nooks arise out of this confused way of building may be seen from the hills whence one has the town here and there in a bird's-eye view almost at one's feet add to this the shocking filth and the repulsive effect of stalybridge in spite of its pretty surroundings may be readily imagined but enough of these little towns each has its own peculiarities but in general the working people live in them just as in manchester hence i have especially sketched only their peculiar construction and would observe that all more general observations as to the condition of the labouring population in manchester are fully applicable to these surrounding towns as well manchester lies at the foot of the southern slope of a range of hills which stretch hither from oldham their last peak kersalmoor being at once the race-course and the monsacre of manchester manchester proper lies on the left bank of the irwell between that stream and the two smaller ones the irk and the medlock which here empty into the irwell on the left bank of the irwell bounded by a sharp curve of the river lies salford and further westward pendleton northward from the irwell lie upper and lower broughton northward of the irk cheatham hill south of the medlock lies holm farther east charlton on medlock still farther pretty well to the east of manchester ardwick the whole assemblage of buildings is commonly called manchester and contains about four hundred thousand inhabitants rather more than less the town itself is peculiarly built so that a person may live in it for years and go in and out daily without coming into contact with a working people's quarter or even with workers that is so long as he confines himself to his business or to pleasure walks this arises chiefly from the fact that by unconscious tacit agreement as well as with outspoken conscious determination the working people's quarters are sharply separated from the sections of the city reserved for the middle class or if this does not succeed they are concealed with the cloak of charity manchester contains at its heart a rather extended commercial district perhaps half a mile long and about as broad 
and consists almost wholly of offices and warehouses. Nearly the whole district is abandoned by dwellers, and is lonely and deserted at night. Only watchmen and policemen traverse its narrow lanes with their dark lanterns. This district is cut through by certain main thoroughfares, upon which the vast traffic concentrates, and in which the ground level is lined with brilliant shops. In these streets the upper floors are occupied, here and there, and there is a good deal of life upon them until late at night. With the exception of this commercial district, all Manchester proper, all Salford and Hulm, a great part of Pendleton and Charlton, two-thirds of Ardwick, and single stretches of Cheetham Hill and Broughton, are all unmixed working people's quarters, stretching like a girdle, averaging a mile and a half in breadth around the commercial district. Outside, beyond this girdle, lives the upper and middle bourgeoisie, the middle bourgeoisie in regularly laid-out streets in the vicinity of the working quarters, especially in Charlton and the lower-lying portions of Cheatham Hill. The upper bourgeoisie in remoter villas with gardens, in Charlton and Ardwick, or on the breezy heights of Cheatham Hill, Broughton and Pendleton, in free, wholesome country air, in fine, comfortable homes, passed once every half or quarter hour by omnibuses going into the city. And the finest part of the arrangement is this, that the members of this money aristocracy can take the shortest road through the middle of all the labouring districts to their places of business, without ever seeing that they are in the midst of the grimy misery that lurks to the right and the left. For the thoroughfares leading from the exchange in all directions out of the city are lined on both sides with an almost unbroken series of shops, and are so kept in the hands of the middle and lower bourgeoisie, which, out of self-interest, cares for a decent and cleanly external appearance, and can care for it. True, these shops bear some relation to the districts which lie behind them, and are more elegant in the commercial and residential quarters than when they hide grimy workingmen's dwellings, but they suffice to conceal from the eyes of the wealthy men and women of strong stomachs and weak nerves the misery and grime which form the complement of their wealth. So, for instance, Deansgate, which leads from the old church directly southward, is lined first with mills and warehouses, then with second-rate shops and alehouses. Farther south, when it leaves the commercial district, with less inviting shops, which grow dirtier and more interrupted by beer-houses and gin-palaces the farther one goes, until at the southern end the appearance of the shops leaves no doubt that workers, and workers only, are their customers. So Market Street, running southeast from the exchange, at first brilliant shops of the best sort, with counting-houses or warehouses above. In the continuation, Piccadilly, immense hotels and warehouses. In the farther continuation, London Road, in the neighbourhood of the Medlock, factories, beer-houses, shops for the humbler bourgeoisie and the working population, and from this point onward large gardens and villas of the wealthier merchants and manufacturers. In this way any one who knows Manchester can infer the adjoining districts from the appearance of the thoroughfare, but one is seldom in a position to catch from the street a glimpse of the real labouring districts. I know very well that this hypocritical plan is more or less common to all great cities, I know, too, that the retail dealers are forced by the nature of their business to take possession of the great highways. I know that there are more good buildings than bad ones upon such streets everywhere, and that the value of land is greater near them than in remoter districts. But at the same time I have never seen so systematic a shutting out of the working class from the thoroughfares, so tender a concealment of everything which might affront the eye and the nerves of the bourgeoisie as in Manchester. And yet in other respects, Manchester is less built according to a plan, after official regulations, is more an outgrowth of accident than any other city. And when I consider in this connection the eager assurances of the middle class that the working class is doing famously, I cannot help feeling that the liberal manufacturers, the quote-unquote bigwigs of Manchester, are not so innocent after all in the matter of this sensitive method of construction. I may mention just here that the mills almost all adjoin the rivers or the different canals that ramify throughout the city, before I proceed at once to describe the labouring quarters. First of all, there is the old town of Manchester, which lies between the northern boundary of the commercial district and the Irk. Here the streets, even the better ones, are narrow and winding, as Todd Street, Long Millgate, Withy Grove, and Shud Hill. The houses dirty, old, and tumble-down, and the construction of the side streets utterly horrible. Going from the old church to Long Millgate, the stroller has at once a row of old-fashioned houses at the right, 
of which not one has kept its original level. These are remnants of the old pre-manufacturing Manchester, whose former inhabitants have removed with their descendants into better-built districts, and have left the houses, which were not good enough for them, to a population strongly mixed with Irish blood. Here one is in an almost undisguised working-men's quarter, for even the shops and beer-houses hardly take the trouble to exhibit a trifling degree of cleanliness. But all this is nothing in comparison with the courts and lanes which lie behind, to which access can be gained only through covered passages, in which no two human beings can pass at the same time of the irregular cramming together of dwellings in ways which defy all rational plan, of the tangle in which they are crowded literally one upon the other, it is impossible to convey an idea. And it is not the buildings surviving from the old times of Manchester which are to blame for this. The confusion has only recently reached its height when every scrap of space left by the old way of building has been filled up and patched over until not a foot of land is left to be further occupied. The south bank of the Irk is here very steep, and between fifteen and thirty feet high. On this declivitous hillside there are planted three rows of houses, of which the lowest rise directly out of the river, while the front walls of the highest stand on the crest of the hill in Long Millgate. Among them are mills on the river. In short, the method of construction is as crowded and disorderly here as in the lower part of Long Millgate. Right and left a multitude of covered passages lead from the main street into numerous courts, and he who turns in thither gets into a filth and disgusting grime, the equal of which is not to be found, especially in the courts which lead down to the Irk, and which contain unqualifiedly the most horrible dwellings which I have yet beheld. In one of these courts there stands directly at the entrance, at the end of the covered passage, a privy without a door, so dirty that the inhabitants can pass into and out of the court only by passing through foul pools of stagnant urine and excrement. This is the first court on the Irk above Ducey Bridge, in case any one should care to look into it. Below it on the river there are several tanneries which fill the whole neighbourhood with the stench of animal putrefaction. Below Ducey Bridge the only entrance to most of the houses is by means of narrow, dirty stairs and over heaps of refuse and filth. The first court below Ducey Bridge, known as Allen's Court, was in such a state at the time of the cholera that the sanitary police ordered it evacuated, swept and disinfected with chloride of lime. Dr. K. gives a terrible description of the state of this court at that time. Since then it seems to have been partially torn away and rebuilt. At least looking down from Juicy Bridge, the passer-by sees several ruined walls and heaps of debris with some newer houses. The view from this bridge, mercifully concealed from mortals of small stature by a parapet as high as a man, is characteristic for the whole district. At the bottom flows, or rather stagnates, the Irk, a narrow, coal-black, foul-smelling stream, full of debris and refuse, which it deposits on the shallower right bank. In dry weather a long string of the most disgusting blackish-green slime-pools are left standing on this bank, from the depths of which bubbles of miasmatic gas constantly arise and give forth a stench unendurable even on the bridge forty or fifty feet above the surface of the stream. But besides this the stream itself is checked every few paces by high weirs, behind which slime and refuse accumulate and rot in thick masses. Above the bridge are tanneries, bone-mills, and gas-works, from which all drains and refuse find their way into the Irk, which receives further the contents of all the neighbouring sewers and privies. It may be easily imagined, therefore, what sort of residue the stream deposits. Below the bridge you can look upon the piles of debris, the refuse, filth, and offal from the courts on the steep left bank. Here each house is packed close behind its neighbour, and a piece of each is visible, all black smoky, crumbling, ancient, with broken panes and window-frames. The background is furnished by old barrack-like factory buildings. On the lower right bank stands a long row of houses and mills, the second house being a ruin without a roof, piled with debris. The third stands so low that the lowest floor is uninhabitable, and therefore without windows or doors. Here the background embraces the pauper burial-ground, the station of the Liverpool and Leeds Railway, and in the rear of this the workhouse, the quote-unquote poor law Bastille of Manchester, which, like a citadel, looks threateningly down from behind its high walls and parapets on the hilltop, upon the working people's quarter below. 
above ducie bridge the left bank grows more flat and the right bank steeper but the condition of the dwellings on both banks grows worse rather than better he who turns to the left here from the main street long millgate is lost he wanders from one court to another turns countless corners passes nothing but narrow filthy nooks and alleys until after a few minutes he has lost all clue and knows not whither to turn everywhere half are wholly ruined buildings some of them actually uninhabited which means a great deal here rarely a wooden or stone floor to be seen in the houses almost uniformly broken ill-fitting windows and doors and a state of filth everywhere heaps of debris refuse and offal standing pools for gutters and a stench which alone would make it impossible for a human being in any degree civilized to live in such a district the newly built extension of the leeds railway which crosses the irk here has swept away some of these courts and lanes laying others completely open to view immediately under the railway bridge there stands a court the filth and horrors of which surpass all the others by far just because it was hitherto so shut off so secluded that the way to it could not be found without a good deal of trouble i should never have discovered it myself without the breaks made by the railway though i thought i knew this whole region thoroughly passing along a rough bank among stakes and washing lines one penetrates into this chaos of small one-storied one-roomed huts in most of which there is no artificial floor kitchen living and sleeping room all in one in such a hole scarcely five feet long by six broad i found two beds and such bedsteads and beds which with a staircase and chimney-place exactly filled the room in several others i found absolutely nothing while the door stood open and the inhabitants leaned against it everywhere before the door is refuse and offal that any sort of pavement lay underneath could not be seen but only felt here and there with the feet this whole collection of cattle sheds for human beings was surrounded on two sides by houses and a factory and on the third by the river and besides the narrow stair up the bank a narrow doorway alone led out into another almost equally ill-built ill-kept labyrinth of dwellings enough the whole side of the irk is built in this way a planless knotted chaos of houses more or less on the verge of uninhabitableness whose unclean interiors fully correspond with their filthy external surroundings and how could the people be clean with no proper opportunity for satisfying the most natural and ordinary wants privies are so rare here that they are either filled up every day or are too remote for most of the inhabitants to use how can people wash when they have only the dirty irk water at hand while pumps and water pipes can be found in decent parts of the city alone in truth it cannot be charged to the account of these helots of modern society if their dwellings are not more cleanly than the pigsties which are here and there to be seen among them the landlords are not ashamed to let dwellings like the six or seven cellars on the quay directly below scotland bridge the floors of which stand at least two feet below the low water level of the irk that flows not six feet away from them or like the upper floor of the corner house on the opposite shore directly above the bridge where the ground floor utterly uninhabitable stands deprived of all fittings for doors and windows a case by no means rare in this region when this open ground floor is used as a privy by the whole neighbourhood for want of other facilities if we leave the irk and penetrate once more on the opposite side from long millgate into the midst of the working men's dwellings we shall come into a somewhat newer quarter which stretches from st michael's church to withy grove and shude hill here there is somewhat better order in place of the chaos of buildings we find at least long straight lanes and alleys or courts built according to a plan and usually square but if in the former case every house was built according to caprice here each lane and court is so built without reference to the situation of the adjoining ones the lanes run now in this direction now in that while every two minutes the wanderer gets into a blind alley or on turning a corner finds himself back where he started from certainly no one who has not lived a considerable time in this labyrinth can find his way through it if i may use the word at all in speaking of this district the ventilation of these streets and courts is in consequence of this confusion quite as imperfect as in the irk region and if this quarter may nevertheless be said to have some advantage over that of the irk the houses being newer and the streets occasionally having gutters nearly every house has on the other hand a cellar dwelling which is rarely found in the irk district 
by reason of the greater age and more careless construction of the houses as for the rest the filth debris and offal heaps and the pools in the streets are common to both quarters and in the district now under discussion another feature most injurious to the cleanliness of the inhabitants is the multitude of pigs walking about in all the alleys rooting into the offal heaps or kept imprisoned in small pens here as in most of the working men's quarters of manchester the pork-raisers rent the courts and build pig-pens in them in almost every court one or even several such pens may be found into which the inhabitants of the court throw all refuse and offal whence the swine grow fat and the atmosphere confined on all four sides is utterly corrupted by putrefying animal and vegetable substances through this quarter a broad and measurably decent street has been cut miller's street and the background has been pretty successfully concealed but if any one should be led by curiosity to pass through one of the numerous passages which lead into the courts you will find this piggery repeated at every twenty paces such is the old town of manchester and on re-reading my description i am forced to admit that instead of being exaggerated it is far from black enough to convey a true impression of the filth ruin and uninhabitableness the defiance of all considerations of cleanliness ventilation and health which characterize the construction of this single district containing at least twenty to thirty thousand inhabitants and such a district exists in the heart of the second city of england the first manufacturing city of the world if any one wishes to see in how little space a human being can move how little air and such air he can breathe how little of civilization he may share and yet live it is only necessary to travel hither true this is the old town and the people of manchester emphasize the fact whenever any one mentions to them the frightful condition of this hell upon earth but what does that prove everything which here arouses horror and indignation is of recent origin belongs to the industrial epoch the couple of hundred houses which belong to old manchester have been long since abandoned by their original inhabitants the industrial epoch alone has crammed into them the swarms of workers whom they now shelter the industrial epoch alone has built up every spot between these old houses to win a covering for the masses whom it has conjured hither from the agricultural districts and from ireland the industrial epoch alone enables the owners of these cattle sheds to rent them for high prices to human beings to plunder the poverty of the workers to undermine the health of thousands in order that they alone the owners may grow rich in the industrial epoch alone has it become possible that the worker, scarcely freed from feudal servitude, could be used as mere material, a mere chattel, that he must let himself be crowded into a dwelling too bad for every other, which he for his hard-earned wages buys the right to let go utterly to ruin. This manufacture has achieved, which, without these workers, this poverty, this slavery could not have lived. True, the original construction of this quarter was bad, little good could have been made out of it, but have the landowners has the municipality done anything to improve it when rebuilding on the contrary wherever a nook or corner was free a house has been run up where a superfluous passage remained it has been built up the value of land rose with the blossoming out of manufacture and the more it rose the more madly was the work of building up carried on without reference to the health or comfort of the inhabitants with sole reference to the highest possible profit on the principle that no hole is so bad but that some poor creature must take it who can pay for nothing better however it is the old town and with this reflection the bourgeoisie is comforted let us see therefore how much better it is in the new town End of chapter two part two